Hello and welcome to Conscious Living Radio. My name is Mark Curran and you're listening to 100.5 CFRO FM in Vancouver Co-op Radio. And today uh, I will be hosting the program. Tasha is away on an actual shoulder injury. So she's hurt herself. So I'm taking over until she's back probably next week. And today I'm with um, my good friend and co-producer, co-host, and host of Spirit Plant Medicine Conference. And we have some very special guests today. But first, I'd like to introduce Stephen Gray. Stephen, always a pleasure to have you on the program. Hey, Mark. Hey, folks. Good to see you. So, Stephen, we have a couple of great guests we've spoken with before. I thought I'd give you the honors of introducing them. And uh, we can get going with our program. I'm really excited to uh, share what these gentlemen have to, to, to bring to the world. Sure, um, I will do. Uh, thanks, thanks for for, the, for that, Mark. So, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We have Rob Laurie. He's the uh, gentleman who's not wearing a hat that you're seeing, and uh, uh, <laughs> Rob Rob is a lawyer, and I've known Rob, you know, a bit here and there for I don't know five six years now. He's really been a wonderful advocate for uh, people uh, fighting for space, you might say, in the plant medicine world. Uh, actually keep it really brief, but I will say that the first time I saw Rob was um, uh, when I was helping support one of the dispensaries in Vancouver who were trying to get an exception to some of the rules that were happening, happening and Rob was there supporting another group. And he's been very involved ever since, and uh, a, a devotee of our conference as well, etc., and even more involved as he goes. Uh, so we'll just leave it at that for now. And our other guest um, <clears throat> is the gentleman who we've accused of looking like a 19th century cowboy, um, mm -hmm. Michael Stewart Annie. Uh, Michael is, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> is um, a great, has been, has been for a very long time, a great advocate for um, uh, traditional uh, lifestyles, um, benefits of all kinds for uh, indigenous people of the Americas. He spent a huge amount of his life uh, working in that field, for example, 13 years, if I, I hope I got this correct, Michael, um, 13 years working with direct a line of contact to uh, Venezuelan President uh, Hugo Chavez, Chavez uh, um, helping um, alleviate uh, uh, insect-borne diseases in Venezuela. He also has a book called The Ghost Dance, which is a fascinating book. You wouldn't realize until you read that book how central that theme is to where we are as a planet and where we need to go. Uh, Michael has also spoken twice at our conference. Pardon me. Yes, twice. Yes. Oh, there's the book um, that Rob is holding up. And, uh, and now Rob and Michael are doing some uh, incredible work down in Mexico, which we are going to discuss today. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. The only thing I want to correct, um, I worked for three different presidents mm. during that time, um, not just Chavez. For Chavez, it was about four or five years, but I worked for Carlos Andres Perez and Caldera. It was across three different presidents. Right. So... And officially, I've worked for no president, so uh, we got to remedy that sooner or later. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Some some famous person in the state started. You'd know he what who he is, but I don't remember him. He started a campaign, and they had billboards all over the country that said "Nobody for President." And then there were things like "Nobody cares for you" and "Vote nobody" and all this stuff. <laughs> anyway, enough silliness. Uh, uh, we're here to talk about, or to have you guys talk about this wonderful initiative uh, you have. So why don't one of you start off and explain this? Okay. Um, a little over a year ago, down here in Oaxaca, just when COVID was starting to hit, down in southern Oaxaca, um, it hadn't hit yet. Um, but we were seeing it starting to creep down. We were becoming aware of it. And I had been going around to just visiting friends in different villages and pueblos and realized that there was absolutely no outreach medical possibilities for introduced disease. Now, the people of the regions, a lot of the indigenous people, they, um, they have good remedies. I got bit by a yellow scorpion the other day. They gave me hot chocolate and lime and milk and it. 20 minutes later, I felt better. 
um, not totally better, but a bit better. Um, and but they had nothing. And I started thinking about, gosh, what could be done. And it, I remembered that in the Amazon, when I worked with the Yanomami in the epidemics in the 80s and 90s up into 2000, that we went through tons of pharmaceuticals and had about 12% results, not very good at all. And then a friend of mine brought me Artemisia nua, the plant, and we first used it for malaria, and we were having exceptional re results. Um, eight to nine out of the 10 people we would give it to rebounded very quickly, but we noticed something strange, that it was working on dengue fever also. And it was working on other diseases like schizomoniasis and parasites. And a big misnomer people have about pandemics and epidemics is we're getting COVID, COVID, COVID. But the fact is, especially in the third world, people and in, and in the Western world too, people who get these diseases usually have other diseases already. So to just pinpoint one disease and not look at the whole situ situation is appetite for disaster. It's not going to clear up the problem. So I came up with an idea to bring Artemisia new seeds down, and I spoke to Rob about it. And Rob said, you know, I may have some ideas and people that could help. So me and Rob talked about it a bit, and um, and... In the lockdown time, I actually grew a field of Artemisia nua so I could get it in easily. So I had these seeds down here. And on the very most grassroots level, we've actually gotten the seeds to many villages already, simply by just going to the village and handing them the seeds. Nothing more technically advanced than that. But as I found in the Amazon, it's an like, Amazon delivery. What's that? I said the original Amazon, hand delivery. Right, the, <laughs> very much. Yeah, um, what we found was exactly that, that um, what the barefoot grapevine, just giving it to one village and they see their health improve. They have relations in another village. They just give it to their friend, their uncle, their mother-in-law, whoever, and that gets passed on to the other. And without all the technology and the trillions of dollars and all this shifting of it, it actually works. So we very much, and I very strongly believe, Rob and I have talked about this a great deal, that at this point, we need all the people included. This isn't, um, the health of everyone depends on us all. And if we don't bring in all the people these viruses and germs, they have no respect for walls, borders, anything. That's the old story of the plague. In Europe, during the plague, many of the royal families would go out of the countryside and put knights around their house. And when the plague passed, they'd go and they open up the summer castle and all the knights would be outside and everybody would be dead inside because they're incredibly small viruses. So that's what the healing garden is. It's a plan to bring medicinal plants that can help in times of epidemic to people that have no other medical care related to introduced diseases. Yeah, very clear. So uh, maybe one of you could speak a little bit. Well, actually, that brings up for me anyway. Uh, Mark has his questions, I'm sure. Uh, at least a couple more right off the bat. One thing you said a moment ago, Michael, is that we need to bring everybody in. What does that mean specifically, log logistically, so to speak? Yeah, a gr great point. As we're seeing now, what's happening is the wealthier countries, and Mexico is a perfect example. Mexico had a deal with Pfizer and other companies to have, I don't know, but millions of doses for the jab down here. And of course, the wealthier countries went, no, 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 they're third in line. We're taking it. So there's... In the general population, there's a shortage down here. And when you're talking about indigenous people, which many of them are completely off the grid and have never gotten anything close to correct medical care introduced for the introduced diseases, um, they really have nothing all over the world. And there's millions of people like this. So to think that, okay, on this side of the border, we're going to get everybody cleaned up with an experience 
with experimental drugs and take a drug that has tw a plant that has 2,400 years of history and experimentation that works and then say, well, you know, um, we just don't have, they have to wait. No, this way for very little money and for support only, everybody can be part of this thing because I've learned this fighting epidemics. If you don't tackle the whole situation, they just wait in the cut of the viruses, find the weak spot, and come back in a viral storm. Mm -hmm. So what do you need from people that are watching or listening to this? Yeah, um, I, on my profile page is our fundraiser platform we have right now. And that's what we're trying to do is just raise money for simple things, gasoline to bring the seeds around, um, um, some pumps in regions where there's no water, so they need to have pumps so in the dry season they can grow the plants um, to pay the basic, you know, work fees of, of the people from the villages. Once it gets started, the people are going to do it themselves. So it's really, we need startup money, even though we're already started. The truth is we're already started and I'm basically paying for everything right now, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not in a financial position to keep on doing that. It's kind of the odd thing of the um, philanthropist world is only those rich enough and people go, well, you can't make any money, which I understand the money should go to the thing. But the people who really have the knowledge about these things and the expertise in the field like me spent their time in the field and were in, in an office making tons of money. So those who have the ability are on the outside and those who have lots of money um, but know nothing about nature or living in it, and I don't want to drop any names of very powerful people and people from who, who don't know nature of these people at all. And they're making up the curricula about people they know nothing about. And the way they're making up the curriculum is to completely forget about that. And that's not going to work for all of us. I assure you, if we do that, as Larry Brilliant talked about this right in the beginning of when this um, pandemic was breaking out, and he was the man who brought up the original idea that wiped smallpox off the earth. So Larry knows something um, and um, said, People wake up and look at the whole picture or quote him. It's going to be a shit show. And isn't it? Yeah, you bet. Rob, what's your role in all this? Well, I saw Michael speak at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference in 2019, I believe it was. And he, he just shot the lights out as a speaker. I mean, it was just incredible to hear his story his enthusiasm i mean his experience resonates in absolutely everything he does and uh well ernest hemingway once said we need to burn the fat off our souls and i feel i'm doing that with working with michael and having run a, well i run a very successful but not a lot of overhead in my business i mean i'm used to doing things uh, on the edge of a shoestring so what Michael's talking about and the scale and the potential, it just takes a little bit to get going. And uh, well, I don't know many folks who fought pandemics. And when Michael then suggested after following up from Spirit Plant, you know, we've kept the friendship and developed a relationship since uh, fall 2019. So really this topic has evolved because on anything that I do with respect to legal work involving an indigenous piece or an anthropological piece or an element dealing with something that is outside of my skill set and my experience, well, I know enough to work with folks who can round out that experience and and that's why I'm really excited to be working with Michael. And so that's what my role is, is well, Michael is boots on the ground, and uh, I do what I can to assist him with what I can do. And with isn't technology and communication so amazing that I can literally be on Vancouver Island in my home working, but yet I'm connecting with Michael, who some days he's in Oaxaca, other days in Veracruz, and well, 
you know, he's driven down before and up and down uh, to Latam to North America. So you never know where you're going to be. And I don't know. I just see, given that everything going on in the space, and we were talking prior to going live about the involvement and participation of numerous public companies and private companies all trying to do any number of things. Well, it's nice to for me to assist and be a part of projects that are truly unique, have variety, and uh, well, allow me to connect and learn that through and my involvement, the actual tradition, the real authentic history, and you know that's what it really blew my mind about Michael. Is here is somebody who, again, just one of his adventures was working with or with resources provided by the Venezuela, Venezuelan military and uh, with direct assistance from, from Hugo Chavez. You couple that with his, again, decades of experience studying with First Nations and Indigenous sages. And again, Michael, you should speak to the point that I've been using terms that I shouldn't be using. Um, <laughs> such as well indigenous you corrected me on that in the past but for the for the but the why i'm using that term now is to show the depth and the breadth and the variety and uh yeah i'm, I'm really loving what we're doing that yeah, answer your question Stephen. well a point oh yeah sure that, yeah um a point to that of course rob and i've talked about this a lot and it's what you folks were talking about before we started how this relates to the psychedelic movement, the Renaissance, yes, is yes. Um, in my experience that the plants never opened up and talked to me until I really started giving to the people. Mm. And before you give to the people, in my opinion, the plants will give you a carnival, they'll give you a show, they'll let you look at the back of your head and wonder who the I, me, I is. But if you want to go through that threshold, as Wade Davis says, the sheer horror of it all, and stand your ground as a medicine person and go through, it takes many years to do that. And the key to it is giving to the people. So as um, Rob was talking about earlier, that a lot of these people who are getting in, they're saying things, but... I want to see them truly show, and here's a means for them to show firsthand. Mm -hmm. We're giving to the people. We're giving these seeds away for free. We're setting up for free. I would like to see some of these companies who are planning on making millions of dollars off traditions that nobody would know about if it wasn't for these Native people. And, and I assure them that they will have trouble in their path because these plants are not a commodity like cornflakes or cigarettes. Um, they have their own thing about them. And when you start to monetize them big time, and we've even seen this in cannabis, and you don't treat them correctly, people have big problems. And, and I think that's key. And I think it's really, as we talk about the spirit plant medicine, we're talking about medicine for the mind, the soul, and medicine to keep the people alive that have the real, the few people that have the true knowledge of these plants and understanding. Wonderful. And you know, um, oh, go ahead, Mark. So, Michael, I, I love what you're saying because I've always been a believer that really nature is the best pharmacy out there if we're going to talk pharmacy. And so many pharmaceuticals are derived from nature and derived from plants. So what is it specifically about this Ar Artemisia? Artemisia, 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 Anua. It's, it's, there's many Artemisias, um, wormwood, mugwort, but this is a particular one, A-N-N-U-A, Anua. And, Artemisia. and where, what, where is it native to in terms of where would it naturally grow? It, it's native to a region of China. Hmm. And... 2,400 years ago, the Chinese used it during a malaria epidemic and had remarkable results, wrote it down. And then just at the time that, we, that the epidemics in Venezuela were going out of control and, um, and Bill Gates was looking at the situation, um, we got in touch with the woman in China who rediscovered it and put it out and 
I'm not. I believe she actually won the Nobel Prize for it. She. I know she was nominated for it, and she brought it forth and said, "Listen, we're seeing no resistance to this, and that's part of the problem. It's really showing us what's going on with everything now." Um, after we had the results in um, Venezuela, and stories had come back earlier from Vietnam that the way the Viet Cong survived through the heavy malaria seasons was with this plant. Mm. People started to look at it. Wow. And um, Bill Gates decided to have it synthesized and remove one compound from it, artemisinin. And um, it was married together with all things, something that's been in the news or not, um, hydroxychloroquine. Nice. And that became the world standard to this day for malaria. But mm. he was very much warned back then that if you mix it together with a synthetic that has already dropped to less than 12% success to resistance, the virus who's smart, the bioengineering of virus is 10,000 Einsteins and 100,000 computers. That's why what we're seeing today with the vaccines, we're chasing the dog's tail. As we're coming up with new vaccines, the virus is like two months ahead <laughs> mutating mm -hmm. already. And and it's an RNA virus, so it's collecting information, and all this information it's collecting, and the more it gets, it's going to be able to do that more. So we need a full program. I'm not, I've am not. i worked on vaccination programs. I'm not an anti-vax person, but working on vaccination programs, I know they're not clear-cut. I know there's not one disease. It's a fallacy to look at that. I know like all surgery and medicines, some people they work well on and some people they don't work well on at all. There's not a standard at that nature. So we need all the tools in our toolbox because what's happening, why we're completely consumed fighting this terrible situation we're in and bringing our top scientists and people trying very hard to get over this. We're financially involved, both Canada and the United States, in destroying the Amazon. And by doing that, we're going to release viruses that make this look like a cupcake. And I know they're out there. We call them bush fever. And I've seen them. They're there. And all these viruses come out of the bush, all these diseases. They're in a host somewhere hidden from the human herd. And the, the hipster saying the the Amazon is, the rainforest is the lungs of the earth. The earth does not have lungs. It's a cute expression. The earth breathes more like a skin, if you believe it's alive. So trees in, um, in northern Canada um, put out, um, take oxygen, CO2, do the same process, just like a tree in the Amazon does. But what is different, it's these forests that, insulate us and block the human herd, the mass of people from these hidden viruses. And like in China, when that, I've been to that area in China, when those forests are torn down, these viruses come in contact. The problem isn't bats or cute little armadillo creatures everyone's killing for whatever reason. They have to jump into animals that have had a lot of contact with our DNA. If you'll notice, it's always chickens or pigs or birds that are, are near humans all the time. Over years, they've picked up so much of their DNA, it can jump in them. It's not going to jump directly from an exotic animal. That was one of the first things in the beginning. I'm like, people, this is scary. Tell us the truth. We're not children here. And so that's why I started to see that we've got to come at it with all these directions or we're going to get ourselves in the middle of a pandemic storm. And there's a good possibility of that the way we're handling things. Yeah. Well, wouldn't you say we're, you know, based on all media reports, we're in the middle of that right now? <laughs> I did. <laughs> Thank right. you, Mark. You know, I didn't want to say that. Rob would have said that. I'm trying to be a little more polite. <laughs> no, I know, but it depends on, you know, your your school of thought and your belief. And it's interesting to see how science is so opposed to the science. There's experts on both sides of the coin for what's real, what's true, what's not. And I think even if they told us the truth, people aren't going to necessarily believe right. that anyways, because there's so much um information i'm not even going to say misinformation because 
we don't know even how to filter it anymore and where do you believe your source. So that being said, when we take a look back at nature now, because your experience in the 80s with the pandemics and epidemics down in the jungles, you didn't have pharmaceuticals and vaccines to work with, is my understanding. No, we did. No, it was quite the opposite. Um, when I was first with the Yanomami, much earlier than that, probably 15 people on the earth knew who the Yanomami was. By the time the pandemics hit that, the epidemics hit them, they were the most famous tribe on earth. It was in the news. So many, many, I mean, at that time, every, my garage, my neighbor's garage, my kid's garage, all were stacked to the ceiling with millions of dollars of medicine. We got tons of stuff. We had things going. But what I saw was in the field, and I'll say it here, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, it has side effects. It doesn't do well on indigenous people. You have sun reactions. You have visual reactions to it. The missionaries who take it all the time end up with Parkinson's systems and blind. And, mm -hmm. um, and we were having a 12% success rate. That's why when Bill Gates and who blocked many African countries and destroyed their economy, growing Artemisia Nua to make the power of this synthetic um, and become the standard with a mixture instead of the pure thing. There was no reason for that. The hydrochloroquine was almost worthless in the field. It was purely financial and political reasons for that. And now those pills are becoming extremely resistant. So when the Max Planck Institute came out and said, we have tested Artemisin and new, and we have found over 20 compounds that either block, manipulate, or go right after the COVID virus. The World Health came out and said, this could be true. We're not saying it's not true. There's evidence that would make us believe. But we're very worried that if we use it, we'll have this incredible malaria breakout because of all the people using it. Um, it'll become resistance. And I'm not pointing a finger, but I'm trying to give an insight. That's an incredibly racist remark because mm. maybe not in the United States and Canada, except on, on reservations, but in the third world, as I started, most of these people who have COVID already have malaria and already have dengue. So if we have a plant that can deal with respiratory problems, malaria and dengue, I mean, come on, you know, people. And that's why I'm saying, you know, if you want to show in the psychedelic community and in the business end, you want to show support for the people and you bet you better. Or my advice is, as Rob knows, we've been at these meetings is you're going to find yourself in trouble, one, with the tribal people and two, with these plants. Here's a very simple way by helping us on grassroots on the ground. And as Rob was saying, I'm right here. I'm a barefoot guy on the ground kind of guy. That's why Rob's so good to me. I call Rob up and plug in. I'm in southern Oaxaca right now, as far south of Oaxaca as you can get, out in the bush where we've had absolutely no COVID here. We've had the first case a few days ago, and that fellow's in the hospital right now. But there's been none of it here, zero up until that. Um, Here's the opportunity for people to get involved, and we want to bring this to the Pueblo tribes, to the, the, the Diné, the Navajo, who have suffered terribly. The elders among the Pueblo tribes and the um, Diné, the Navajo in the United States, it's been a death march. It's been a true trail of tears for these people, and this is not going to solve the problem for all of us. If there's any two messages I think nature's making to us really clear is the first, in the first six months, when they closed down a lot of things, I think we were all startled and amazed how quickly nature started to heal. She showed us an incredible... People want to see a spiritual sign, a magic sign? Well, look up in the sky. Look at the birds. Look at the dolphins. Look, Mother Nature showed us she can still hear no matter how we've messed up things. And the second thing is we got to be in this together. And that's what the Healing Gardens Project is. It brings everybody in. And to the point, we want to set up the project where someone in San Francisco or in Paris, they can get a Healing Garden kit and grow their own Artemisia and, um, 
Matico and other plants that are excellent during during epidemics right in their homes. It's for everyone. I'm I'm way past the excluding this group, that group. Um, that's the biggest lesson this is teaching us. We're in this together, and we better realize that. Yeah. Well, I, I, so, I love your, your just what you're saying about inclusivity. And, you know, we need connection and inclusivity more now than ever, really, I think, in the history of mankind because of all I the agree. division and separation. It doesn't matter whether you talk politics, science, but whatever it is, the division is like it's it's obvious so one, one question i have for you michael because you talked about the healing garden and you did mention another plant are there other plants that you are also looking to share with people around the globe and in the amazon for their own healing gardens yeah when we started out um i contacted the shabibo in peru and the shabibo on one level have been westernized for even 50 years ago, back in the Amazon, they'd already been westernized. But the Shipibo became very famous for the use of ayahuasca. And they have a long medicinal history. But they had some money. So when corona hit, they ran to the pharmacy and got medicine. It wasn't working. It was expensive. And they were very um, witty people. And they sent their medicine people out. And their medicine people found, not in Amazonas, but about at 4,000 feet, a plant called Matico. And Matico um, is working wonders with those tribes. So it's not even just one plant. So our only deal, there's only one business deal involved in this thing, which is when we give these as a gift to a village, we ask two things of them. One, if it works for them, pass it on. And two, we have to work together and everybody inclusive, and the plants, we ask from the communities that they put a plant in the garden, if their corinderos have one, and they pass it on. That's the only thing we're asking of people. We're not asking them for money or to set up a thing for them, and, um, and that's how I hope this will spread. And, you know, sometimes we're learning these days that low-tech gets things done where high tech sounds all super interesting. Um, I don't want um, Elon Musk to put a chip in my brain. You know, I'm not interested in that. I don't know how that's going to help me survive in my world. You know, I'm sure maybe in his it helps in some strange way. Strange guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, so um, yeah, it's, it's a very simple. That's part of why I love this project is even though we have no money now, I'm still doing it just when we drive past a village I know. I turn off the road and I go in there and I see who I know and I leave them with some seeds. Yeah, you wonderful. Know? And now we're hoping to get more funding, more, you know, more where we can reach out. And I would love, I was mentioning the Diné and the Pueblo tribes. This is all over the place. If we could get this to indigenous people, Native people, first world, whatever the name you want to use. Uh, sad to say in my day when I was around on the res of the people, everybody said Indian. And when you'd say something like, you know, when the younger people said, is there a problem with that? Like, you know, do you want to be a Native American? They'd say, Native American? He was an Italian guy. Italians play <laughs> Indians in movies. Indians don't play Italians in movies. Mm -hmm. So, um, except for Michael Horse, I think he's actually done it, right? Um, and so um, he was an untouchable, but I guess he was an indigenous untouchable. Yeah. So the word to me, it, it, that's not what this is about. It's about people and their souls and, mm. and our human survival, the survival. I think Mark brought up the point. This, more than any time in history, our survival as a species, not the planet, our survival, is more in jeopardy than ever. Now, people will go, well, you weren't alive during World War II. I was born after World War II. You weren't alive during this. But the difference was with all those other wars and all, the environment was nowhere near being destroyed mm -hmm. at the level it is now. That's yeah. the game changer. Yeah. And if they don't see that the real reason, something we never hear about, we hear about how we're going to put the Band-Aid and how we're going to save lives. Very important. But why it happened, 
why nature, the destruction of nature, and that's what causes epidemics and pandemics. It's nature's reaction to a parasite to rid the parasitic load so nature can sustain itself. In this sad case, we are the parasite. So we have to be about rectifying this natural. If we don't figure out in nature why this is mm-hmm. happening, why when you destroy nature right next to a major city where scientific work's going on and think nothing's going to happen and no one's going to foul up, human beings foul up all the time. It's the nature of all of us, every, all kinds of human beings. Mm-hmm. We need to really look at the situation. And I would say to me the key path we need to go down different is we've always dealt with modern medicine in a way of kill the cancer kill the virus kill those people we don't like the way they look we don't like the way they act kill them but viruses are not out to kill us or hurt us when we get sick from a viral overload it's because the virus is trying to adapt in our body and its experiment is failing and it's going through different things. We have more viruses in our body by a long shot than we have cells of Mark or Stephen or Rob. We have billions of viruses and they've not only come to terms living in our country as outsiders coming into our country, but they found recently that placentas in mammals were created by a very ancient virus very closely related to HIV. So viruses have sculpted us and made us into who we are. We are populated by them. We need to have science that is not about kill and beat this, beat that, or politics like that. We need science and politics about how do we how do we get where we can all get along and everybody's okay with it and the viruses are okay and everybody's tudo mundo tudo bem everybody's okay yeah well you know the the bottom line there michael and you've expressed much of it so eloquently today here is that there needs to be a a a deep 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 consciousness transformation on this planet as the foundation for these kinds of changes but um i also want to uh, uh address a question with you or have you address it if you wouldn't mind uh what i'm one of the things i've been thinking about while you've been speaking is uh obviously this is really world shaking potential here you know i mean we're yes. talking about a virus that is affecting people in every single country of the world this is massive and if there is a natural plant medicine or more but you know specifically we're talking about Art- artemisius annua at the moment um that can have uh that can be better even than you know or like more effective than the, the vaccines that are out there and also ties into the kind of philosophical changes that we're talking about here or you're talking about um i th- the uh, what i'm getting at is that uh if there are people watching or listening to this today that are from a more um sort of reductionist rational background but open uh what can you say to them in other words if they're used to you know gold standard studies you know that that yes. you know double blind placebo randomized studies etc uh that show the effectiveness of a particular treatment what can you say to them if they're going to if if anyone's going to be getting behind this you know that gives them confidence that this really is an effective medicine and i can answer that um right now i figured mexico, you could yeah right <laughs> right now in mexico um about a month ago we traveled to mexico city and i met the head surgeon at the number one research hospital in um in mexico a wonderful guy a, a true person who loves to heal people he he's really the top he's one of the top people in the world in his field and we talked about it and they've taken up the study of artemisia nua and they've finished their first round and said flying colors not only for um covid and respiratory but they're finding really fine results with cancer also mm-hmm. and in mexico it's very 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 hard to get research money for especially a plant 
but they're going forward. So the Max Planck Institute is doing this. The Mexican government is doing this. Madagascar has done it. There are countries in Africa have done it. But the answer that you always get back, because I deal with scientists a lot. You know, my life has been on one side, medical people, and on the other, indigenous people. Um, what they'll say is, well, you can't quantitatively measure a plant. You can't get an exact dose. And there's not the experimentation that's needed. Well, there's real reasons for that. They will not put up and they will block the money for that experimentation because there's financial interest involved because you can't take a plant like this in a natural state and make a fortune off it. You can't, you can't patent get, it. You can't patent it. That's really at the bottom of this dance. And, and then what I say to them, too, when you go to me, well, you know, you're kind of an out there guy. Um, where's the, the full experimentation? Well, where's the full experimentation on these vaccines you're putting out? I mean, this is as close to no experimentation as you can get to get something out. So don't tell me something that worked for 2,400 years and has been documented has no experimental validity. When, when it favors the financial end, they go, throw experimentation out of the world. The computers told us it's work, so we're going to run with it. You know, um, what was it saying I heard the other day? You know, if, um, if they gave us experimental lollipops, you know, with um, deionized uranium, would we all go sucking on them immediately? <laughs> you know, you know. Um, Depends you know, on how sick we are, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Stephen, yeah, that's yeah. a good answer. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. Michael, um, before yeah. we run out of time, because I saw Mark flashed a little, you know, 15 minute thing about five minutes ago. Uh, I just want to also ask you, how uh, could this uh, plant actually replace uh, vaccine treatments in the so-called West or, you know, the technology societies or whatever? I mean, how, that's a hot what's the potential subject. here? Yeah, that's a hot subject. And I do not have the scientific medical expertise to go, yes, I know that's true. And that's mm. not really what I'm trying to get across here with mm. the Healing Garden Project. At this point, we got so many people dying. We got more people dying than, I don't know, the last 10 wars. Is, it's incredible how many people are dying. Um, Health officers have to first deal with the first thing, stop the people from dying. That's their job, and they're trying their best. I'm not down on them at all. The question is, it's not, as Mark pointed out, it's not inclusive, and I have a big problem with that. Now, I do, I'm a very personal strong believer that the future to the survival of humanity is in plants, and that the future of the survival of the consciousness of humanity is in talking plants, you know, plants mm. that really reach out and affect the way we are wired, how we relate to nature, how we relate to each other. Um, and I think that there's a tremendous area, and I know my wife is an herbalist, in the herbal world, you can't even get these herbs anywhere. The herbal world is shooting through the roof. People all over are running to these plants and it's growing like crazy. And we're at a moment where Western medicine has to get off its high horse a little bit and go, hey, we need every tool in the toolbox. We can't say, let's use the right hand, but the left hand's kind of weird to us. Indigenous people use that. So, you know, uh, I don't know. And my last comment to that is, you know, if you look at the situation, for 500 years, Native American people all through the Americas, from the Amazonas to Canada, they're all Americans. We're all Americans. We all live, you know, people say the United States is America. Canada is America. Mexico is America. South America. If we can't come around and understand that even synthetic medicines, they set you up so your system and nature can heal you. Nature is what heals us. These are all vehicles to get to that help. And we can't fight this with one hand tied behind our back. This is the era where medicinal botanical plants are going to rise up 
and really show their potency and a big reason why, as you folks know, I enjoy the conference so much in Canada because it's one of the few conferences that really touches on this. Mm. Well, and I think I helped that being Wade. So, well, I want to thank you, Michael, just, you know, for the wisdom that you bring and the experience that you bring in regards to this conversation, because again, so many different sides of the coin in terms of, you know, pharmaceuticals to plants and everything else. And I look at the, you know, the amount of wisdom, knowledge, information, tools, and resources that this planet has, we have what it takes to heal the world, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's unfortunate that there's still a fact factor of, you know, greed and money and control, whatever it might be with big pharma against the plants. We've seen it in, in cannabis with the legalization of that to now here in Canada, it's, it's legal, ironically, from a recreational point of view versus medicinal. And what do you think it would take? Because I'd love to see the, the plants that talk, talk to the people who are making these decisions. Yeah, good luck. And, and how, <laughs> how do we... How do we as the, you know, the light workers that we are and, and the, you know, medicine men, if we want to even call it that in, in that aspect, how do we help that shift and that change so that, you know, all of mankind can literally wake up to a higher consciousness and a realization to heal the world? That's the story of my book that thank Rob once again for holding it up. Um, the ghost dance is the first ritual of the Americas. It's the oldest ritual of the Americas. And it's the story about how this ritual was created by the father of civilization, Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent, and how he foresaw that in the end of this fifth world, it will be humans that can destroy their place in nature, not fire or, um, or hurricanes and all so I believe that there's actual rituals that can do it, and it leads back to where we started. If you really want to go to the next level of these plants, from my knowledge, um, which I put a lot of time into, um, the key is um, there's a threshold of real stark raving terror. And um, you have to hold your own against that and get through the carnival of psychedelic flashing colors. To me, that's just the plants keeping outsiders at a distance. Um, native healers don't see that. It's an interesting thing that Westerners see all the psychedelia. They don't see that at all. When I've showed them that, they're like, what's that? <laughs> like, <laughs> if I show them a drawing I do of a spirit, they'll know exactly what it is. They'll go, oh, that's that, right? So I believe... We need to bring a certain, I believe the people we're losing, why we're fighting and so focused on this pandemic that's on us, in the Amazon under Bolsonaro, he's killing like flies the very last people who have this knowledge who can save us. We're, we're so focused here, we're allowing people to destroy the thing that's going to get, you know, so he can get us. So I'm very much a believer that as you brought up, I'm not against recreational. When I was, well, I was young, I was in the jungle. But before I was in the jungle, I played in bands and all. That was fairly recreational. Um, and I'm not against that at all. But um, the bottom line is we really lost, as you point out, with cannabis, um, the um, medical end of it. And I know that firsthand because I, my wife is from a town in, in California where all the big research in the United States was done on grand mal seizures and epilepsy in children with, um, with cannabis. And we saw miracles. We saw kids show up from all over the world, all over the United States, that were vegetables. They were having 12, 15 grand mal seizures a day, these kids. They were torn apart. And a year later, they're like, teenagers it's like what a miracle and you know they've all left because the strains and what the commercial world's putting out doesn't cure them anymore mm. because we went we went too far away from that ritual that kind of got you two guys started and i know you were trying desperately to pull people back to the understanding of that 
And I think um, that's key. I think that's a true service. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So we do have to uh, wrap it up, guys. So, Michael, maybe you can tell us how can people support this mission of yours? Uh, I'll say Rob's. something, then I'll let Rob say something, because he may be a little bit more articulate. We have a fundraiser going. We have a platform going on right now. And you can get all the information on my profile page at uh, michaelstewartonnee.com. Um, yeah, and it's on my Instagram, theghostdance.com. Um, and, um, and please just give, there's gifts that you get back from giving. But I'm really saying if people want to give to something that really is grassroots and is on a very small, direct level going to make changes. Um, and if they're in the psychedelic world, in the business side of it, I'm very strongly, and me and Rob have been to meetings together where I very strongly advise the people of that, where, you know, they'd say to me and Rob, oh, we're going to put you in the nonprofit side because you're such good people, and we're going to make all the money, but you're going to convince the people on the reservations to go along with our silly malarkey. Um, and me and Rob are like, okay, goodbye, we're, leaving. we're going to lunch, you know, and away we go. Um, and so I really feel we have something that touches on um, plant medicine um, on all levels, healing, mental medicine. And I really believe this is something very simple that people can just give to this foundation here, give to this one project, Healing Gardens, and they will see endless videos of me driving through the mud and mm -hmm. riding mules and dumping seeds here and all the wacky things I do usually. That's wonderful. And, and you know, people must know that of all the charitable organizations on the planet, this one probably has the smallest administration fees of any. We right? have, we have my, my goddaughter, who um, I partially raised, who was born in Oaxaca, um, she is the administrator and my wife helps her. That's how little we are. And we get advice from Rob. That's as far as that goes. And we've been together with another foundation, the Roots Foundation in Mexico. And um, they, have li they have limited administration too. You know, the Amazonia Foundation, my foundation was very successful in the field and eventually was backed by, um, by the Virgin Trust and by Branson and my beloved Anita Roddick from the Body Shop. God bless her. Um, and I never, I don't know how to raise money. You know, that's why I've gone to Rob and you folks. This, I'm the guy who spent his life learning how to deal with this stuff. I'm just asking people, I gave my life to this. Give me a little help so I can keep going. And Rob, can you help him clarify that, what, what people can do? Well, that's the thing. There's a number of folks who claim to be experts and professionals in the space. And uh, well, if you're going to be involved with plants and plant medicine, you need to be involved with people that understand their language. And I don't claim to understand, but as a lawyer, I represent people that do. And my involvement, I mean, this isn't the first Amazon project I've been involved in. I mean, I've been working for the last two years with Rex Weiler, the co-founder of Greenpeace, with the Ecuador Amazon Restoration Project Society, which involves effectively big oil and the Chernobyl of the Amazon. Absolutely. With, again, as a lawyer, that's where Rex uh, brought me in because of um, Stephen Donzinger, lawyer who was defending the, the indigenous effectively was hung to a cross by the oil companies. And so that when having, you know, then seeing Michael at Spirit Plant was like, you know, maybe I can help. I've got some <laughs> ideas. I do everything on a shoestring budget anyway, no resources and uh, having to uh, still complete the mission. It sounds like a, a, an average day in my world. So that's why it's a good synergy. We're able to do a lot with what we have and, uh, I think it's an exciting way to, well, again, actually be connected and learning about these cultures and traditions, not just in my own backyard, but now in the other, other, other hemisphere. And it's just, again, from a professional who genuinely loves this work 
and protection of the environment and stewardship of the planet, well, this is totally in line with with what's important to me. And well, I have we have fun doing what we do, and it's always a great conversation. And that's really the important thing. We're having fun and enjoying what we're doing. We're helping people while at the same time, you know, it doesn't really require much of what we weren't going to be doing anyway. So, so it, do you do you need do, do, does there need to be more information added from what Michael said about how people can actually contribute to this? Well, yeah. what I'm going to do, guys, it's oh. all going to be listed on ConsciousLivingRadio.org. We're going to do up a page yeah. like always for Wednesday for the airing of the show. <clears throat> and we're going to have all the information, everything you can do Thank the link there. You. Thank you, Mark. It's already shared in the uh, the comments on this Facebook Live video as well. So it's already in there for people who want to tune in. Yeah. And we'll also start sharing some more within our Spirit Plant Medicine Community Group, our Conscious Living gr uh, Network Community Group as well, so that we can get the word out there. Michael, I love what you were saying just about, you know, all these people out there profiting on psychedelics right now in terms of whatever work they're doing. Um, and I remember Paul Stamet saying something about that in an interview we had with him a while back with Stephen. Um, it's, you know, make sure you give back, make sure you pay your taxes, make sure that you give back to the people who have brought us these plants in a way that we can work with them. And I think that that's the big message here because nature is the best pharmacy and there are ways to, uh, heal ourselves, help others heal and really, you know, perpetuate good health for all of mankind across the globe. And it's going to start, you know, one seed at a time and keep it going. Uh, I, I'd be happy to have you back on again, Michael, Rob, we talk about these things all day long. It's always a pleasure uh, to share your wisdom and your experience. Uh, Stephen, I thank you as well for joining us as co-host again today on Conscious Living Radio. You're welcome. And uh, we do need to sign off today. My name is Mark Curran. You've been listening to Conscious Living on 100.5 CFRO FM here in Vancouver. <laughs> Support Michael's Healing Garden, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. The gods give to those who give to the gods.